Welcome back to the channel. Hope you're all keeping well. So I'm in Leeds today for an evening with Glenn Hoddle. So I'm absolutely delighted to be joined by Tottenham Hotspur and England legend Glenn Hoddle. Glenn, how are you? I'm good, thank you. Yeah, nice to be up in uh, in Leeds, meeting everyone tonight. So yeah, looking forward to it. Glenn, of course, you suffered a cardiac arrest in 2018. How has life mm. been for you since then? Um, well, I call it my extra time because I was, you know, gone for sort of eight or nine minutes. So yeah, uh, my health's good, been good. Make sure I'm getting my walks in and stuff like that. Bit of swimming. Bit of golf, and uh, no, I'm just happy to be alive, really. To be honest, this is, as I say, my extra time, so it's, it's just uh, life's precious, and you've got to take every minute as it comes. Do you miss uh, not being a football now? Um, no, I'm still in doing my punditry, still involved in around football, uh, of course, it's part of my DNA, but I um, uh, don't really miss it. No, there's other things that I'm interested in and doing, and business stuff. I've got four grandchildren now as well, which takes up a lot of my time. So yeah, I'm enjoying my Two FA Cups and the UEFA Cup at Tottenham. Yeah. What would you say your favourite ever memory whilst being a Tottenham Hotspur player? Well, I think I think after supporting Tottenham when I was eight years of age, you know, to walk up them steps and pick that FA Cup up, which meant a hell of a lot back in the day. Yeah. Um, watching every year as a kid. Watching all these teams go up and dreaming whether I would ever do it, I think that was the one that stands out for me. That first time we won the in '81, '82 was special. I scored the winning goal and whatever, but that first time to get over that line, you know, Spurs hadn't won anything for about nine years, so it was important. It was uh, we were back in the big time, and um, yeah, it was it was a wonderful feeling. Glenn, okay, we haven't won a trophy in 16 years. <laughs> when are the trophies coming? Well, that's a good question. It's uh, it's not going to be easy because every club in the country gets better and better and um, so it's not easy but Ange is doing started off you know got to give him a bit more time but uh, certainly with the ball attacking wise it's the way Spurs want to play I'd like to see him just be a little bit uh, more reserved in their defending mm -hmm. uh, to actually and if he does that I think if they do that if they learn and, and, and improve on that then I think the balance of the game is there that, that, that we could win something but I think I'd like to see that change pretty quickly because um, do you think it will? Going for well I don't know I mean Ange knows what he wants and that's what he did at Celtic and, but I think when you're playing against quality top top quality teams like the Premier League and, and certainly if you get into Europe um, you might just have to adjust that a little bit but um, because there's two sides of the game it's not just all about attacking but I think after the couple of seasons that we had it was pretty toxic at Tottenham it was, yeah. like it was turning and suddenly he's come with the start of football that's completely at the other end of the Richter scale and I think that's why the fans have took to him wonderfully well and they love watching the ball played and pass as it, as it has done and, but whether we get the balance right to win trophies and to be successful consistently, I think we just need to adjust a couple of things defensively, and I think we'll be there. So it's not a big, it's not a big change around. So we're very close to it. I was going to ask that in terms of the transfer window. Of course, uh, we've had two under hands so far. In the summer transfer window coming up, what do you think Tottenham need in order to put us <coughs> right up there? I don't think it's a matter of what what they need. I think it's it's the whole the overall tactics of adjustment is needed. It's not a individual. I think we're very close. Obviously, if there's good players available and you can get them, look at Van der Ven um, coming to the club. He looks like he's, he's, you know, he's obviously a bit injured at the moment, but he looks as if he, for me, if he didn't get injured, I said at the beginning of the season, looking at him, yeah. he would be in most players' Premier League side. Him and, ben, him and um, Romero. No, him and the guy at Liverpool, um, Virgil van Dijk. Yeah. They're the best two in the country. If you put them together, funny enough, they're Dutch. Um, so he's, he's a fine he is. And if we you know, if we get a couple of more players like that in different positions, a couple of wide men that are you know, really attacking and uh, top players, then I think we're not far off. Then you once swapped shirts with Johan Cruyff. Yes, I did. Yeah. What, what, yeah. Where's that shirt? 
I got no idea what a shirt is. <laughs> I'm terrible like that. I don't. I've never been. Uh, I've got no England shirts. But no, I've given them all away to charity. You don't collect a lot of things. No, my, my cousin took some off me for his boy, so he's got them in his on his wall. But he's only got one or two. But I haven't got a clue where that one is. Actually, to be honest, nor, Glenn, nor have I got any others. Glenn, talk to me about um, the the managerial career at Tottenham. Of course, you come in in two thousand one. Yeah. Um, of course, Enoch mm -hmm. took over at the club. Yeah. Uh, you were sacked in 2003, had a League Cup final that we lost in between. Mm. Well, talk me through your managerial career. No, it listen, it was first too long to, to go through. But, you know, very quickly it should have been the place where I was the happiest in management. It yeah. wasn't. It was the most unhappiest I was. And that tells it all, doesn't it? Because I wanted to do so much, so well for the club. But the politics of the club was wrong. There wasn't any finances there. Uh, the squad wasn't. Depth, you know, the depth of the squad just wasn't there either. So it was a very frustrating time for me. It really was. But um, you know, you move on, and uh, you know, that, looking back, that was probably the most um, disappointing and saddest time as a manager. When you managed England, um, what was your what was your favourite memory of managing England? It, and is it the impossible job? No, I think it's not impossible. No, it's, uh, back, it's a lot easier now than it was back. With managers before me and managers around about my time, it's, it was harder then. I think, I think uh, the players give you a bit more of a break nowadays because of how it is in life. Um, but um, no, I think the proudest moment was qualifying, qualifying in Rome uh, for the World Cup. It was, a, it was a special night, it really was. And then you know walking them out at Marseille. Um, I done it as a player in World Cups, and to do it as a manager as well it was, it was immensely proud. Glenn, what have you made of uh, Gareth Southgate's uh, appointment at England and what he's achieved? And if he does um, go after the Euros, who would you like to see as an example? To be honest, England? I think I think he's done a great job, and I think he will go after the. Uh, I think he will go after the uh, here, uh, the Euros if he wins it. It's a good time to go, um, and if he doesn't, he'd probably go anyway. So at the end of the day, it's uh, it's time. <laughs> um, <laughs> so it's. Um, yeah, it's, uh, I think we've got as good a squad as anyone, if not better than most, in the tournament. So we should we should feel very confident about you know what we what we can achieve there. And um, I think final semi final would be is a must really with the plans that we got. But uh, that little bit of luck, a little bit more belief in ourselves, and that little bit of um, sort of arrogance about ourselves because we are a bloody good team. Uh, I think we can win it. Glenn, okay, last question for you. Yeah, if I was to ask you two predictions, a a year when Spurs win the next trophy and England. Oh, well, I ain't got a clue about that. You're, you're as, anyone, anyone's, anyone can come up with that. I don't, have you got a crystal ball here? Yeah? I, um, I don't think we're far off it. If, as I say, as I said earlier, just a few adjustments defensively. And this for England, we won't have a better chance than this summer. Yeah. Glenn, pleasure to talk Cheers. to you. Thank you so much. Can come on, you Spurs. Can I have me fish sandwich now? <laughs> So I'm now with the legend Paul Coit. Paul, how are you? I'm good. How are you, Chris? Good to see you. I'm very good. Very I good. didn't know you got north as well. We go everywhere. We go everywhere, all over the world. I know. Um, how's the season been for you? Season, I think it's been great. I mean, it's been it's been so much better than expected. The thing is, it's 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 really funny, isn't it, when you get some people that go, oh, God, look at that result, and it's all going. But you know, that's what we like, Spurs fans. But on the whole, I th progress. I think it's been fantastic. The excitement has been brilliant. I know, you know, I know from people at the club that are saying, look, we didn't expect the start that we had. We honestly didn't. It's, you know, it's way in front of what we were expecting because, you know, of course, there's all the talk about the project and it's going to take time. It's going to yeah, take time. Yeah. But I just, it's the atmosphere. It's the style of the football. This is, for me, above winning. It's the style of the football, the atmosphere, and it just feels right again, doesn't it? Of course, there's going to be bumps in the road, but they're going to get less and less and less, and I'm, I'm absolutely loving this season. Can I ask you about that? Because your pitch side, the yeah. atmosphere has been incredible mm. this season, has it? Every single game. Yeah, absolutely. The, it's, I can do it on, I've got like a knees knocking test, and it's, and it's, and it's, how, sh it's how shaky I am after I do the speech or do the teams. And um, sometimes, and, and this season, and just before that, and just before we get Adam playing the trumpet as well, I put I put the mic down and and I walk off, and I'm like, yeah, yeah, I'm feeling it because really, it really does. You, the noise from down there is unbelievable. I've got I've got these little earpieces in, which I wish I didn't have because that kind of blocks out some of it. But yeah. you can feel it around you, and to be uh, in the middle of it, it's just magnificent. I've asked about players and said, you know, 
Can you feel it? What do you think? And they absolutely love it. Absolutely. Who, who have you most enjoyed interviewing this season? Um, I'll tell you who I've enjoyed more than anybody else. Pedro Porro. Never met Pedro before. And every now and again, there comes a player, and it happened with Sonny the first time I met him, and there's been a few of them down the line where you just think, my God, you are a superstar. And he came up, and not only do I love him as a player, he came up to the lounge where we, we, we did in front of them. Um, it's probably about 100, 200 people. And he came up, and he was, and he got my sense of humour straight away, which sometimes some people don't, Chris, you know very well, and he got it straight away. And, you know, we have a photograph, he's picking up kids and having his photograph taken with them. He played with the audience, you know what I mean? And he was loving it, and he enjoyed it. And, and he's that player that plays and you can tell that he loves what he's doing. He loves playing for Spurs. You know, he has, he plays with a smile on his face. I love Romero. When Romero came up, I asked him about Mickey van der Ven. And he and, and you know what's also great about them is that they're all trying English. Pedro yeah, Porro. I've seen that. You know, Pedro Porro, this is someone who's just learning English and he went, no, I'm going to try it. And he, you know, he had Roberto Barbonte, who's, who's there as well, who's player play liaison, has been for years, and he does the translations. But a lot of it, he didn't need Roberto, and he did it himself, which is not easy, you know? Yeah, yeah. And he was brilliant. And then it was the same with Chris and Romero as well. He came up and uh, asked about Mickey ben, van der Ben, and I said, what can you say about Mickey? And he went, Mickey is my brother. And I just thought, oh, God, I love that. They've all been great. Madison came up. We had a lovely one with James Madison the other day, and um, I hadn't seen Cliff Jones in quite a while. And, you know, I love Cliff Jones, you know, Cliff and everybody loves Cliff Jones. No, I haven't seen Cliff for a while. Because Cliff's 90, you know, and yet this year he's 89, mm. just mm. turned 89. And um, I, I was interviewing uh, Matters and then I looked down and there was Cliff Jones. So I just stopped everything and said, like, everybody, quickly, because I wanted James Madison to meet him. Yeah. And it was a lovely moment because Cliff came up and... And Madison was brilliant with him, and I said, "You know who this is? You know this is Clifton." And he said, "No, of course I do." And it was just—it was just a really. I love to see that when you get new players meeting the old, and so they realise how important they are to all of us. And came up, and then Cliff came up, did it. It's a grand old team to play for, and he did the whole song. But he was great. So no, I've, honestly, it's a. What's what I really love is what a great bunch of players they are at the moment, Chris. Mm -hmm. I don't know, we, I'm sure you've yeah, come across yeah. this as well. It's a great personality. Yeah. And that's another thing that I've learned recently is how important personality is when it comes to buying new players and young players coming through. Um, it's it's so important. And it's nowadays you can see that they're choosing them on how they are as personalities as well as how they are as, as players. It's like Vicario as well, first of all. They're, oh, they're just brilliant. They really are. And Ange? Ange is great. I mean, I've, I've, I have made a fool of myself twice with Ange. Can go, I, on. Can, go on. Can I do this? What do you reckon? First time. So, well, I've met Ange at um, the Christmas party, and he was, he was lovely. We had a chat. And then the Man City game. Now, the FA Cup Man City game. I was standing near the tunnel, so I've just done my bit, and we'd done a thing about 81. And I was walking, and then it was Ange coming in the other direction to me. So I thought, right, okay, well, there he is, there's Ange. I thought, what did I say? And he was, you know, when someone looks right at you and you think, oh, hello. Anyway, I don't know whether he was looking at me, he was probably looking at the pitch. And I went, oh, Ange, good, good. Yeah, went to shake his hand. My hand grabbed his wrist. <laughs> He's there. He's looking the other direction. And it was like, okay, I think I got away with it until I realised it was live on ITV. It was oh, as they're walking out. Oh, dear. And I'm getting all these messages going, yeah, that was awkward. <laughs> that was awkward. And then the next time, I did an interview with him in front of about 100 sponsors, and my phone started going off in oh, my no. pocket. And it was it was playing some song. So I'm trying to do this. I'm trying to turn it down. And I'm thinking, oh, no. I've, 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 oh, so I want to impress him. I don't want to upset him. And he just looked, he just looked straight at me and went, mate. I think you want to turn your phone off. And then that was it. I was just telling everyone, Courtney, he's such a professional. <laughs> You've got your phone in your pocket. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Can, can I just say, and I'm not saying this just because I'm, I'm here talking to you now, yeah. one of my favourite bits of this season is your motivational speeches. Oh, really? You, Thank you, you. You have worked on them Well, this season. I, you know what? I kind of have and haven't because it's each day and I think, right, what can I say? What can I do? And it's used, last one was when I was walking back, I was on walking back home from the tube and then I thought, I know what I can do. It was like the one with the Misosa uh, Sissoko's um, um, armpit. 
and it was with Liverpool. And so yeah. something will occur to me, but sometimes I'm like, God, it's a lot easier now, though, I tell you, Chris, than it was last season. It's a oh, lot yeah. easier yeah. to do now. How confident are you for top four? Um, top four, I am confident. We've had one blip against Fulham. Yep. The team's back. They know that it was a bad performance. Let's get the hell out of the way and let's go kick. Absolutely. So you're looking forward to hearing that oh, Champions League music again? I can't wait. Yeah, I can't wait. On that note, thank you, Paul. Come thank on, you Spurs. Good. So I'm now at the Yorkshire Spurs event with Glenn Hoddle. Uh, I'm joined by Mike Rolo, of course, former uh, commercial manager at Tottenham Hotspur Football Club. 36 years in the job, Mike. How are you? I'm fine, thanks. Yeah, surviving in retirement. Yeah. Talk me through the 36 years at Spurs. You must have seen it all. Uh, commercially, yeah. Uh, I mean, when I started, it was a very much of a pioneering job. There was hardly anything apart from a bit of uh, perimeter advertising, but nothing much else. So uh, that was really why I was brought in in the first place. And you were behind the Holston deal? Yeah, I mean, I, what happened was that, uh, you know, little did I know when I came in that um, there had been negotiations going on because uh, uh, um, shirt advertising had just come in and uh, with another company and uh, that failed. Uh, then what happened, it looked did we know in those days that uh, we were going to be live at the end of that season uh, uh, being on in the UEFA Cup final, but of course uh, that wasn't known. So when we were due to play Manchester United on the 16th of December 1983, uh, I was told that with uh, having just joined in, in, in the early first week of November, Mike, we need to find a, a sponsor to go on the shirts. Wow, you know. So I was only used to selling newspaper advertising for in 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 in, in publishing. So anyway, I went off, and uh, I think the people, a lot of people who know me, know the story. I went into the White Hart uh, on the way home one night. Uh, it had a bottle of beer, and it had Holston on it. I thought, mm, you know, German. So I wrote it, wrote the name of the address on the back. Uh, those who remember directory inquiries, I, I rang up that, got the number. Went down for the uh, uh, for the uh, chat. I mean, obviously, it didn't happen just like that over a two or three meetings. But uh, yeah, I mean, uh, the, I'll, I'll always they always have someone in life who's your mentor. And that MD of uh, of, uh, of of Holston, he changed my life because mm. uh, you know when he stood up, say, "Young man, you got a deal." Uh, when I went back to the club, the the, uh, the Peter Day, the club secretary, he did believe me. He had, we had to get. Uh, we had to, in those days, wasn't any faxes or uh, or even, well, definitely no emails. So they sent a telex message. So I think I've still got the telex message, you know. <laughs> so, I mean, as I say, uh, fortunately, it didn't have to do uh, anything with smoke signals. That, that, that had passed, but it was very early days. And uh, anyway, Holster became the sponsors, and uh, they stayed with us uh, uh, cumulatively for about 20 years. Mike, I believe it was 1983, um, Jimmy Hill at Coventry started off the corporate hospitality. Spurs followed on from that. And now, look at the Tottenham Hotspur Stadium, it's incredible with the corporate, corporate hospitality. Um, talk us through the early 80s with that start of the hospitality at Tottenham. Well, we, 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 we started because we, we, we had these 72 boxes in, the, in this custom-built West Stand. So, and that was one of the only stands of its kind in the country at that time. Uh, but when the 72nd box was sold, we were still getting people interested in taking hospitality. So I thought, hey, why not? So what we did, we just added on people in the, in the lounge, which is known as the Bill Nicholson Lounge in, in the West End in those days. And it went from there. I started up various little things like uh, match day sponsorships or match ball sponsorship. Anything that moved, I sponsored. And I got some, some companies to sponsor that particular facility. And the numbers grew. And by... Within five years, we were getting something like in excess of 500 people uh, in the lounges, uh, and it went on from there. And of course, uh, any chairman, whether it would be Irving Scholar, and then followed by uh, uh, Alan Sugar, could see that there was that was the way the future was going to be. So more and more lounges got added to the West End, culminating, of course, uh, you know, with Daniel Daniel Levy, where when the when the, the, the new stadium was on the drawing board. Uh, the, the hospitality or the, the, nowadays they call them premium seats was obviously number one on the agenda but I mean uh, you've got to remember that I think if I remember rightly out of the 62,000 uh, capacity only 8,000 is taken mm. up in, in premium seats so I don't think anybody should think that it's taken over the stadium in fact it's a mere, a mere percentage
Mike, you mentioned the three chairmen there. What was it like working under them? Yeah, <laughs> each one different. Uh, um, Irving Scholar was an astute businessman, and I think by his own admission, once he uh, went over the threshold, being a Spurs a supporter took over. And so perhaps a lot of his decisions were, were, were in, by heart. Mm -hmm. uh, and perhaps, you know, just that, as it happened, uh, the, the money in the game uh, wasn't forthcoming as, as much as it is nowadays. And uh, we, it, we, we have stretched ourselves a little bit. Yeah. Uh, we diversified into having Hummel and uh, lots of other subsidiaries. And perhaps it was a little bit too far at that stage. It may have been one for the future. But of course, the club were in dire straits, as, they, as it were, come the end of the uh, end of the 80s, uh, going into the 90s, and, uh, and of course, we all know that uh, that in uh, that, that FA Cup final of 1991 uh, was actually a, a turning point, and not only for the club in winning the trophy, but also, you know, uh, Alan Sugar came on the scene, got in touch with Alan, uh, with Terry Venables, of course, who was looking for somebody to. To go in with him, and of course that's what happened. Uh, you know, and so Alan Sugar became the chairman. Mike, the amount of times I've seen you in the lounges and people nudge me and say, "Roy Hodgson's here." Yeah. How many? How many times do you yeah. get that? Well, I'm afraid. I think that this <laughs> happened. The old Barnet, which was nice and dark, and it was nice, you know, real thick hair and everything. And of course, even that, the old uh, little chin was started to grow. I think that was the Holstons that got that to go. But uh, yeah, I mean, I had, I, I had actually bumped into Roy Hodgson, particularly when he was England manager. He used yeah. to come to games at Spurs and uh, he used to say to me, I look like his younger brother. <laughs> yeah. You're writing a book now as well. Tell us about that. Yeah, well, I mean, a slow, slow, slow writer. Um, yeah, I mean, I, I think what it was more than anything, uh, I think anybody who gets to a certain age thinks, well, I must start writing things down before I forget them. Uh, so, so, so I started, and it started off as like a diary, and then it started into a book. But I'm about three quarters of the way through now, so probably within the next, uh, uh, you know, six months. That is, that, well, hopefully not a year, but it'll, it'll, hopefully I'll be looking for someone to publish it. But it's not controversial to the extent that anyone uh, should think, oh, well, he's an addition of dirt. Because yeah. one thing I have to say, and I, and I mean this, that I have the old violins playing in the background when I say this, but I mean, you know, I, I, I love the club and I, and, I, and I owe the club a big one because it gave me a great career. And all I can say about it is, is obviously positive things. Of course, there were lots of controversies. I give you the background of all the things that happened, the, 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 uh, all the, the individuals concerned. Uh, but I think that more than anything, it's a positive read, mm. but also at the same time, more revealing than perhaps anybody's ever really read, read about the, the inside of the club before. Who is the most interesting person you've ever spoken to at the club or in, in all those years, 36 years at Tottenham? Interesting? Uh, it depends what you think about what you call what interesting. I think that uh, the people who inspired me, uh, I have to say um, Alan Sugar, uh, everyone would say about you know, this it with it pointing the finger and saying you're fired and all this business but I managed to hit a, a note with him where he knew that he wanted people who would get out there and uh, and, and, and do the business and uh, and I knew the product yeah uh, but he gave me the backing so he was very inspirational um, I think another one it has to be Daniel uh, um, because uh, I must say that uh, when he eventually arrived at the club, um, his, uh, his, his, uh, how can I put it? He, he, want, he wanted the best for the club. He, he saw himself as a custodian, which he still does to this day. And I think that um, it was his direction and in his pressure. There was lots of pressure involved. I mean, uh, maybe that's where the grey hair started to, to happen. But uh, I, I think that really, where for the very first time I was being given big um, targets to reach. We didn't fulfil them all the time, but by doing so, uh, we were we were getting to the kinds of levels which you need in a football club, and that's revenue. Uh, and of course, he not only did that with in commercial side, but he also did it uh, in the stadium, uh, and also with, of course, um, I 
dare I say, getting success on the pitch. Okay, I, I mean, there's obviously not the uh, not the big success we all would have loved to have seen, but uh, but uh, you know. Uh, the, the consecutive seasons. How many seasons in the Champions League? You'll know that. Uh, well, uh, hopefully we have Champions League next year. Yeah, but, but how many? Uh, but the consecutive years we did have. There was quite a number of years, wasn't yeah, it? Yeah, it was under um, Pochettino. Um, it was quite a number. Yeah, yeah. So, so I mean, what I'm saying is that um, uh, with the new stadium, I mean, crikey, I mean, I personally think that uh, a lot of people would agree with me that. Uh, um, he, it was it was due to him and, and his, uh, his 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 his, uh, his fever of wanting to get right everything right to the club that uh, that the club really was, they, sorry the stadium was all down to him very much so they should erect a statue probably but uh, you know he's uh, done a great job and of course uh, uh, I think that um, a lot of the supporters are hungry for success and I, and, I, and, 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 and I for one of the same. Um, but uh, hopefully we've now got a manager who who looks to be uh, doing the right things. Uh, we're building for the future, so let's hope it's a, it's the start of a big uh, a big a big winning time. Mike, do you do you miss working at Spurs? Because I know, of course, you've uh, now started your own events company. Tell us a little bit about that as well. Well, I, I mean, I, yeah. First of all, I do. I, I, you know, you can't help but sort of uh, miss uh, miss the club. But then, having said that, it's you know, I realise now that comes a time when you've got to. And over and, and uh, there's, there's obviously a, a, a really good team there now yeah. who, who are doing things. For me, when I retired, uh, I, I didn't really want to sit back in an armchair and do nothing. And I just really wanted to keep the old brain busy, really. And so uh, the legends, uh, you know, the Spurs players who I actually brought, uh, many of them, I brought back from retirement and, and actually are now doing things at the club. In fact, uh, uh, you know, uh, I, I'm, very, I'm very proud of that, that uh, so many of those legends I brought back. And um, so we are like a family, uh, you know, um, and uh, I look after the legends by, but I say look after, they can look after themselves, but I, I put on events uh, revolving around golf days and, and dinners and, uh, and theatres and all sorts of events like we're here today. We're up in Leeds here with, for Yorkshire Spurs. and. You know, it just gives supporters all around the country the yeah. chance to uh, see uh, their, 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 the players, obviously, within the Spurs history. Mike, lovely to talk to you. Thanks so much, and uh, good luck with the book. Thank you very much. Thank Cheers. you so much. Thank you.